Hello, I'm Jeremy Fuster with Iraq. As we record this, it's raining in Los Angeles, again. But that's not stopping thousands of members of the Writers Guild of America from taking to the picket lines at studios across town. This past Monday night, the Writers Guild of America and the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers ended talks without a deal. And for the first time in just over 15 years, Hollywood is under a strike. For WGA members, the strike is about more than just wages and the impact of streaming. This is about the future of the very existence of the writer's room, which has been the standard practice for the industry for almost as long as television has existed. So here now joining us to talk about the strike and what writers are fighting for are Quartz Head of WGA members. We have Kate Cannon, creator of the Pitch Perfect Film Trilogy. We have Zach Stentz, a veteran film and TV writer, whose credits include X-Men First Class and several episodes of Fringe. We have Mark Bernardin, a veteran comic book writer and supervising producer on Paramount Plus's Star Trek Picard, and Rachel Blue, the star and co-creator of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Thank you all so much for joining us here at The Wrap. Show of hands, how many of you were around for the 2007 strike? I mean, I was alive, but I wasn't on the line. <laughs> <laughs> so for you guys, what is a vibe bid? Do you guys feel... Like frustrated that you have to do this again? Or do you feel more motivated? Like, what has the vibe been? Well, in 2007, I had just, you know, a year earlier joined the Guild. So I was like a little baby writer who knew nothing and just did what I was told. This go round, I'm on the negotiating committee and very much part of uh, fighting for what we need. And to me, not just my own personal differences, but you just feel it across the board. This is different. This is like, to me, this feels like night and day from, not that those things that we weren't fighting for, they were super important in 2007. Obviously, we were fight. we got, you know, we won the internet. <laughs> uh, but, um, but this go round where it is really, as you said, it's a fight for our existence and for this to be a a profession that we can make a, a living at and um, have middle-class writers and um, and be valued. And so I feel this on a completely different level. It's much more emotional. It's much more, I feel like we're so united in, on this fight. And we had a big meeting last night at the Shrine that, uh, I don't know if you guys were there or not, but it was incredible. We had every labor union every union the dga was there the you know sag was there the laborers teamsters and it was the most uh, like one of the most emotional amazing experiences of, of a united front that i've ever been a part of there have been some similarities to uh to the vibe in 2007 that the in that you know picketing is at its highest you're out there and you're seeing all kinds of people from shows that you worked on years ago and and you know, there's there's this kind of uh, feeling of a family reunion, or in this case, the the new twist is you're meeting people that you only know from social media, which didn't exist in two thousand uh, in two thousand seven. Um, so you know, there's that, but in two thousand seven, it was a much different vibe in terms of of other than the teamsters it didn't feel like we had a lot of support other than lip service from the other from the other unions and this time around for whatever reason um i i think largely because uh because the same uh, the different unions are facing a lot of the same issues with the tech industry disruption of uh of hollywood it it really feels like much more of a united front than it did uh, than it did the last time around and that gives me hope that uh, that we might be able to uh, to to come to come to favorable terms sooner rather than later. Though so that is that is just a hope at this point. Now, when Doji announced a the strike, they said in their email to members that this strike was about preventing the future of writing from becoming a quote a gig economy in a union workplace. From your personal experience and your writing career, how have you seen? that trend towards a gig writing economy and the what ways have you seen the traditional structure of writing in Hollywood erode? Well, you know, it was interesting because Breezy Ex-Girlfriend uh, was a, uh, an actual pretty typical writer's room because we were on network. And I found myself 
seeing that other rooms were not the same. And I was kind of at first jealous because as someone who was writing on the show and also acting in it, I was like, oh, I would have loved to have separate the, separated the writer's room from the acting, from the editing, because I saw so many shows around me doing that. And what I didn't appreciate or understand was what that was doing to the career of writing and the idea of a disappearing writer's middle class. My, I mean, I, I started as a staff writer in a writer's room. Um, that That's where I started. That's what my friends do. That's where my husband started. Um, and so the idea of that actively disappearing due to capitalism, I didn't really understand um, until recently how much writer's rooms were getting erased. I understood the mini rooms. Um, but actually, I was just listening to uh, Kay, your fellow a negotiating committee member, Adam Conover, on the Town Podcast uh, just yesterday. I didn't know that uh, he said that there were basically incentives and in showrunners contracts now where if you didn't have a writer's room, you could get some something like a $10,000 bonus. I was not aware of that. And the idea of, okay, sure, there are some showrunners out there who have limited series and maybe want to, you know, write the whole thing themselves. But the idea of making that the norm and and erasing a writer's room, I had no, I had no idea about. And it's it's uh, it's the foundation of our industry and our middle class. I've never worked on a network show. The closest I got was sci-fi, and one can debate whether that was a network or not. Um, but most of my career has been doing two and three different shows a year just to make your year just to make the money just to qualify for insurance and uh the the amount of times i've been on the second season of a show because it's a year year and a half two years between seasons and i've got to work and i've got to you know I, i've got to provide and so it's impossible to have that same level of both investment in the work you're doing and the apprenticeship that television used to offer seems to be evaporating, which is you used to learn how to do it. You used to write your episodes. You'd be shooting while you're writing. So you'd go to set and you'd produce your episodes. You'd also be in post while somebody else is writing the, the following episode and you go to post on your episode. But if I'm 20 weeks on a show and then I muster out, I'm not part of the rest of that unless the network or the studio decides they want me to be a part of it and want to pay me to be a part of it. Um, it just doesn't happen. And so you have an entire class of writers who, and I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones, you've gotten to work relatively serially that way. But the experience one gets in that room on that staff is not what it used to be. You know, it is, you're not getting the onset experience. You're not getting the producing experience. You're not learning how to talk to actors and directors and, and fellow writers and interface with department heads and prep an episode and post an episode. All of those things are now not fundamentally part of the job anymore unless you're lucky enough to be on a network show. And one can also debate whether that's lucky or not. Um, so it's just, it is, it's slipping is what it's doing. And it's slipping at a faster pace than I think it ever has before. For a lot of people who don't know what a mini room is, and even writers who explain to me say it's insane when they, when they tell me how they explain it, like before they even green light it, well, we want more scripts. So can you either write more scripts or can you hire some other writers to come in and create a mini room and produce these scripts for further consideration for being greenlit. And it's become this situation where, as Mark said, these writers, they will do that work, but then they don't get paid as producers because they don't always get kept or be kept around if the show gets greenlit and then they only get experience of working on these shows. So Zach, I've also heard that this sort of started with mini rooms as a way like some writers would would do it as a way to fast track getting their shows green like you're trying to say hey you know it's not just a pilot i have more scripts you know here this is where my show is going it's worth getting greenlit and now it's slowly becoming old standard practice for some of the streamers and that's coming at the writer's expense i mean i think you can say that you know that's where the practice started. But I think the the even bigger factor was with the rise of streaming, you had the separation of of production of writing the show from from producing the show instead of the old network model, which I always compared to running in front of a grain thresher where you're uh, you're in production at the same time as you're writing episodes and you're just throwing scripts behind you, hoping that the hoping that the machine doesn't uh, 
doesn't uh, catch up doesn't catch up to you um you know so the fact that those things have got have by and large gotten separated made it very easy for the streamers to say okay you know hire hire a few people and write your eight to ten episodes and then be uh and then and then be uh you know let them all go and it'll just be you the showrunner producing them so much of this is focused on streaming and on television you know especially when people when people say things like you know, the the future of the right was was at stake that's the big focus but there has been other things and things like feature writing. Uh, um, Kay, you, you work so much in feature film writing. I understand that it, it's a similar issue in that the pay and the compensation that that feature writers get is also eroding. What what, what can you tell us about feature films and and, what, and the factors of that section in this strike and what writers need in that department? Yeah, for screenwriters, well, first off, in the history of negotiation, screenwriters haven't gotten shit, and we and and often um, the guild hasn't necessarily put forth proposals uh, over the years for screenwriters. It's tough, you know. You're, it's an iterative process. You're working by yourself, you know, um, uh, and every deal is different, and every uh, you know project is different. It's so it's hard to have like a um, a unified proposal that helps screenwriters. However, in this negotiation, we really listened to our um, members. And I think the biggest issue that we had, and it's something I actually spoke to, to the AMPCP in the negotiating room, is the abuse of free work and and how that, and it is an abuse and it's an abuse of power. And they have, especially new writers, they have you over such a barrel that they can feign ignorance. It works so well that they can be like, we don't know about this. There's not a problem. And it's such a problem. So we had two proposals. One was uh, automatic two steps for writers who uh, were paid less than two and a half the minimum, which is not a lot of screenwriters. Most screenwriters get paid over that. It is a uh, process proposal, not a compensation proposal. And they refuse to engage with it although they did say we we could we could have a meeting um to talk about uh the abuse of work between the creatives and producers um which is so insulting um and and then it was like you know they don't they they want your ideas like they just want to take your ideas and and um and they have some disdain i think for screenwriters but our big thing was also getting paid weekly you know tv writers get paid weekly uh, episodic directors get paid weekly, producers get paid weekly, like screenwriters are the only ones that don't get paid weekly. And um, so that that's a big deal for us that they have outright rejected. And we are fighting for that. We are like, if for the first time, I think you'll see that screenwriters, episodic TV and comedy variety are like, we're, we're, we have a huge agenda and all of it's still on the table. And, and it's, important to fight for to stop this abusive work and when we said to get paid weekly uh it was a very specific very smart proposal on how we would get paid weekly and how it would be broken up and their response back was that uh screenwriters wouldn't turn in their work on time um <laughs> it would it would be it would incentivize us to be lazy and uh not meet our deadlines um, and which, of course, I can see by your reactions, you understand how incredibly uh, angry that made all of us because we are professionals and often they don't pay us on time uh, when we do turn in uh, our our scripts. So um, from the screenwriting side, like we feel uh, and also residuals were, were, were our big deal. And that is patternable for everybody. Right. So um, we uh I think for the first time with streaming, um, you have a lot of issues that are uniting us in ways and uniting the guild in ways that that maybe haven't before. Now, back in 2019, there there was another big guild wide labor action where writers en masse walked away from their agents to try to push for the end of packaging fees. And for those who don't know, Packaging fees are a way that agencies, they 
get a fee from the studios for putting together a writer, director, or other talent on a project. And writer, the Writers Guild saw that as a conflict of interest. And it was an over year long struggle. There were dueling lawsuits between the guild and the agencies. And then in 2020, when the pandemic happened, all of a sudden, the WGA was victorious. And the as of last year, there are no more packaging fees. I want to bring up for, for you guys, you know, how do you feel that has helped the guild in terms of getting everybody so unified? Because you guys mentioned that you feel like there's so much more of a unified front within the guild, with other guilds, because there's been so much labor organizing within Hollywood, especially over the last few years. Do you feel like the success of the packaging fee campaign has helped you guys in in organizing behind this round of negotiations and now eventually the strike and getting everybody on the same page. I, yeah, and I also think what it did was really put into motion the guild getting very even more organized with getting the word out in communication. I was looking back at my old emails. Because I remembered in 2017, we authorized a, a, a strike vote. And I was like, did I have a guild captain back then? And I, and I did. It wasn't until 2019, though, that I got assigned a, another guild captain who's actually a friend of mine. I got a lot more emails. My emails kind of show a record of communication that really started with the agency campaign. I would agree with that. I would... I, I was frankly a bit more down on on that campaign and still regarded as uh as uh having been the wrong battle in the in the wrong place but i would absolutely agree that uh that uh the guild became a well-oiled machine in terms of in terms of turning out their membership and that that is that is carried over and the interesting thing is i i talk a lot to uh to writers who are really against the ata action and almost to a person they are all backing leadership on uh, on this time around, and it's and and I'm hearing things like like you know well I didn't agree with that, but they you know the companies forced us forced us into this, and now we're uh, now we're all in. So it's so it, you know I I see things as being much more united uh, un united going going into this, and that's another hopeful sign. My reps are gonna come pick it. I mean, they're asking me where I'm picketing so they can, that's, that's, that's crazy. I've been at some picket lines over the past couple of days. And what's really struck me is not just that the sheer number of Gila riders that are on these picket lines, but I also see people wearing sag after shirts, wearing IATSE shirts, wearing Teamster shirts. I had one rider text me and say that there were three Teamsters trucks that did not cross a picket line that just drove away. Uh, Mark, I'll start with you on this, but like for 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 you guys, like what what first off, have you have you what is have you seen people from other guilds like in, in significant numbers show up at your picket line so far? Or have you seen that level of inter union solidarity so far? So far, it's been remarkable. You know, like I was I was in a line yesterday with Francis Fisher. Who was like out there, like you know, she had her sympathetic strike sign up, and she was handing out water bottles. Um, it is, it is, you know, we're stronger together, and I think that that all of the other unions, all the other guilds, realize that this is coming for them too. Um, that that television as we know it, that cinema as we know it, that the business of cinema as we know it is broken, and and this is the first step in fixing it, and it's going to be ugly, and we get to be the ones who try to take the beach first. Um, but I think everybody's realizing that it's a beach that needs to be taken. And, and if we do well, then they get to do well. Um, if they undercut us, it's less good for everybody. And so I do think that, you know, as Zach said, for the first time, it's, it's felt unified, um, across the guilds, across the disciplines, across communities. And, and it's so encouraging to be out there and realize that you're not alone. It's going to be critical to uh, to kind of keep that energy up. If if 2007 was any kind of precedent, like you had that great surge of energy the first couple of weeks, and then people started getting tired, and uh, you know the free snacks started stopped showing up, and uh, and uh, you know suddenly suddenly it's uh, 4 a.m. 
you're and you're uh, you know in front of a gate with three other with three other people. So all of the work that the uh, that the guild has done to organizing its membership is going to be really critical in keeping that uh, keeping that energy up and keeping people uh, keeping people out there on the on the streets even as you know although hopefully it won't come to that if if things drag if things drag on. I want to speak to that because we definitely have to be athletic about this. We have to be like this. We're in it for as many ring, you know, as, as, and for as long as the game needs to last. Um, but what's so different as, as, as you were saying, Zach, of like, we have social media now. So if we, if this were to last two, three, four months, it's less about the bodies that are, that are picketing and more about the messaging that we're still sending with social media and also doing strategic picketing where we, you know, where Teamsters won't cross a line. So, you know, we can we can kind of uh, divide and conquer in ways that we wouldn't before. And I think the studios are probably banking on us fatiguing, especially in July when it's people are on vacation and it's 115 degrees out. And, um, you know, but um, the, so we need we need to be athletic and, and act like champions and and, and uh, rely on each other. Uh, but then also we have all these other tools that we can use to keep the fight going strong. Zach K, hey, you touched on what my next question was going to be because this strike is at least going to go probably through June because the AMPTP needs to do talks with the Directors Guild and with SAG-AFTRA. The DGA talks start next week and then the SAG-AFTRA talks are supposed to start you know, next in June, early June. So... At least for two months, it's going to happen. You guys are talking about this possibly going on, or at least you're, you're going to have to be ready to for it to go on for several more months. Uh, and sort of talking about like, well, what it takes to keep that momentum going. And we, there have been heads of studios who have been talking about like, oh, we're prepared. We've got our, we've got our show stockpile. All that it, it in, in a sense, for on the studio side, the pandemic was sort of a dress rehearsal on that. It taught them how to to slowly trickle out all the shows that they have stockpiled. How does that change what you what you guys see as, okay, if it goes this long, then they're going to run out of this. So like they're going to run out of time to develop shows of a ball season. If it goes this long, those are going to start getting affected. I'm like, well, what, what, what has the guild told you or what, what do you guys feel is going to be the timetable for how long the pr it will take for the pressure to build on the studios forcing to come back to the table? I mean that's every strike, isn't it? It's 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 can the pain that we inflict on them um, outweigh the uh, the pain that's being inflicted by us from all of us losing our losing our incomes? And you know, I mean, there's some things that were affected immediately, things like the things like the late night shows. But but even with things being stockpiled, the longer this goes on, the longer that you know new pilots aren't going new pilots aren't going to be developed and picked up the you know the uh the pipeline of uh, of features going through is uh is drying up because no one can actually make deals um you know which which affects which affects things downstream so you know there as as the weeks and months go on i i hate that i'm even saying that um but we have to be you know we have to be prepared in case it does um, they are going to the companies, regardless of what they did to stockpile, are going to find themselves increasingly impacted as uh, as the uh, as the spigot dries up. And there's still legacy studios, right, that are deeply affected as well. You know, um, uh, Disney and and Sony and Universal, and you know those those are legacy studios that are allowing the. This is what's really interesting about the AMPTP for the first time is that. You have legacy studios and you have streamers and they're not to totally in agreement with each other. You know, before you just, everybody on that other side of the table is in agreement with each other. So uh, they always say that they've got things ready and they're prepared, but that, but we're doing damage. They don't want this to be happening um, and they'll allow it to happen until they can't afford to anymore. And and I think what we've just constantly have to, we've never been this powerful before and, and negotiations are all about leverage. So if we keep our power and we are, have solidarity with the other unions, it's like, that's what we have to hold on to and not give up. And 
and then if by doing so they're they're gonna hurt i mean they're they're we're we are doing hurt and damage to them right now yeah and sometimes it's even more than just a spigot of new content it's stock valuation you know and they're beginning to take a hit already you know some of that is pr some of that is 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 press but it's it's real and that's at the end of the day what they care about is can we justify our phony baloney jobs can our bottom line keep where it's supposed to be and if this strike can have an effect that's where it's affecting them. it's do they can they still afford that extra yacht yeah i yeah, i i go even further and and say that not only are the legacy studios and the streamers not completely aligned but even the streamers are not don't all share the same interests yeah, like, they're in competition with each other and yeah yeah in like netflix streaming is all they have whereas amazon and apple that's like it's a hobby um, you know, it's like yeah. an incredibly small part of those companies, whereas it's the whole thing for Netflix, which is why, you know, this that kind of persistent rumor that we all heard that Netflix was the big holdout seems so uh, seems so strange since uh, they have a lot more vulner they have a lot more vulnerability as is, uh, is is that being their entire business. But I'm really interested to see what's going to happen with the, the the DGA and SAG negotiations because. I know that a, a big, and Kay, you can speak to this, I'm not the DGA, but I know a, something the DGA really wants it are appropriate residuals when it comes to streaming. And in order to do that, you need transparent, transparency with viewership. And they also are going to, places like Netflix are going to have to be transparent with advertisers about their viewership. And that is something they so far are refusing to do, uh, which may be, I've heard, like the cause of, of Netflix really digging their heels in but i think that there's gonna be a turning point where they realize they have to share their viewership and i i i'm fascinated to see what happens when you have sag and the dga also asking for that because that was one of the things it looked like they refused to engage on right Kay? i feel like netflix was the gateway drug to all of this because when when they first started it was like you can come and do your show and get no notes and you can separate writing and, uh, you know, uh, producing it. And, and at the time, cause I, I had a show that was one of the like first shows on Netflix where it was like, I, I just was so excited that Netflix existed. And, and, um, and then I got to do, I got to do the show and they really, you know, brought a lot of creatives in be, being say we're not television, but now Netflix is TV. Like they're doing pilots now. They're selling ads. Like they're just going back to um, to a television model. And when you do that, you have to, to, you know what you're saying, Rachel, like you have to give your numbers because for ad sales, you have to tell them how many viewers are showing that they're, they're the, the, you know, they have it all and the evidence is there. And as they, as they go back to being just television, uh, cause they realize, oh, we should make a pilot instead of paying a bunch of money to develop a whole season of television, um, that we then don't actually make, uh, and that that old system actually kind of works, uh, you know, they'll have to, they'll, they'll have to reveal themselves and they are the giant, you know, they are the giant that, um, that's winning right now. And, uh, but they're changing. And so we, we use our power to that change. I mean, television was a beautiful system. It was amazing. Everybody got to make shows. Everybody got rich. Everybody was happy. Everybody worked. And then TV got broken. And now we're like reinventing it poorly, but too quickly, you know? And so now like, oh yeah, we're going back to commercials. Oh no, free ad supported television. It's a new thing we're doing. So no, that's just television. And now we're going to have to rebundle all of the streamers that we then got because we unbundled from the cable that we had, which also worked pretty well. And everybody made their money. It's, it is, it is such an insane thing. And like Netflix is, you know, as, as Kay said, they're like the, the, it's not entirely their fault, but they were the biggest spike in what television used to be. Um, and, and they are now the ones that have to be, you know, the most reckoned with, because as Zach, Zach said, they're the most desperate to give it up because they have nothing else to do. And the thing that kills me too, I don't know if, uh, you know, like if, if, if uh, any of you like have written features directly for Netflix, but like their incentives are so perverse because of the fact that they hide all of their data. Like 
you get residuals from a Netflix from a, a Netflix original based on a percentage of the budget, not viewership. So all of your incentives are to inflate the budget as much as you can, which is one of the reasons why you have these $200 million Netflix originals that look like a rom, you know, a rom-com from the mid nineties, because like all of the budget is, uh, is going to above the line and to, uh, to bloat because, because all of the incentives are to pump up your cost rather than to provide something, you know, like the best product for the lowest cost. And we all win. We all win. If it's a big hit, there's, there's no, there's no upside if you give them a hit. And I imagine for you guys that I, I always talk about the profit models going back to old school TV with ad based models and things like that, that it just probably just makes it more frustrating that you're seeing. I imagine it's the streamers that are leading the charge on this whole mini room thing, where it's like they're, they're trying to, to have their KDD to two. They, they're going back to the old profits of old models of profits while trying to create this new system that just even further tightens how much money you guys make. Yeah, I mean, they know they're getting away with something. They know it. They've known it for years. And and they've been like, how long can we do this? How long until somebody stops us from getting away? And if they had their druthers, druthers this is why I'm saying, like, it's a fight for existence. It's a fight for, it's a strike for our value. Is it, And we haven't talked about AI yet, and I think we should. If they could, and I'm not joking, like being in that um, negotiating committee room was just so eye-opening it's like if they if they could they would have a bunch of showrunners with underpaid gig workers as their staff in quotes and they would just have a showrunner and maybe one other person doing all the work from from beginning middle and end and and they're just waiting until ai gets good enough to take over it all you know and 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 the guild, we're, we're, we know AI exists. We have to decide how within the guild we want to use it as a tool. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to codify AI. And I think that's why SAG and DGA are like, you know, are so unified with us because it greatly affects them too. I mean, it's capitalism. Like corporations going to corporate, you know, yeah. like. That's the history of you that I don't I don't think anyone working at these companies, well, maybe a couple, but I don't I don't think anyone working at these companies are, is evil. It's just they're working for a corporation. Your mandate is to in capitalism is to make as much money as possible and do it as efficiently as possible. And the reason unions exist are it's the the one way to regulate otherwise unregulated, unfettered capitalism. So it's codifying. I think someone else said like it, it's. It's codifying things that used to just be a kind of unspoken standard into, okay, we need to now make these rules. And they're gonna they're gonna have AI replace us unless we say no because that is efficient and that will make them the most money. Yeah. And I want to second what you said about uh executives because the, especially the creative executives, they wanna make good shows. They wanna they wanna be a part of it, you know, like and and I agree with you, like um, it's, it's not, it's, it's the, it's the big, bad corporation and not the people within. I, I'd actually argue that, that some of the things that they think that they're doing to save money and to make as much money as possible are actually not working for them and are, and are creating a worse, a, a worse product by, by being penny wise and pound foolish. I think that investing in writers is is the smartest investment that they can make because we're the ones that that and you know create the things that generate billions of dollars for them they could get us for less than they think they can you know yeah. what i mean like it's not as if we're asking for the world we're not asking for half we're not asking for a quarter we're asking for like treat us like humans like recognize the work that we do value it the way we value it it's not an insane ask right and 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 to make that case that you were uh, making, Mark, about people uh, learning the craft, you know, of of being on set and learning how to do it and learning how to show run, we presented that. We made that case of like this this is actually going to help you, studios, if you this thing that's been working for a hundred years, <laughs> keep that going. And their response, I don't know if you guys heard this, but because um, we just uh, shared it last night at that meeting 
is their response was, um, I'm not kidding you. They floated a, an idea for an unpaid internship where the showrunner would pick a writer that then would go and shadow showrunners, you know, and, and be on set or whatever. And, and it was just like, Oh, so that's what you think is going to make us um, be like, okay, yeah, we 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 figured it out. It's fine. Yeah. And again, like it's in their best interest. Like if you grow a field, a crop of new showrunners who have great new ideas, who can execute those ideas and deliver unto you new things, it's better for you. As opposed to, we have these 12 guys, they're probably white and probably male, and they're going to deliver unto you the same things they have for the last hundred years. And maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Or you could have a hundred people from all, all over the map, from all, from every different creed and race and whatever, delivering you the new, the thing you can't get out of AI for next to nothing, but not nothing. Do it. Come on, invest. That's what you're good at. But that would assume that it's not a corporation that, that knows what's going on. <laughs> like, existential and also that's creatively existential and I, a lot of people in these corporations, even though they deal with artists, they're finance people. Yeah. They, there's a reason they're not creatives. I'm not saying that of everyone. I'm just a lot of the people who are making decisions are more business minded than creatively minded. So an existential for the good of something, I, I don't know if their brains work that way. Yeah, a hundred percent. Look, we spend a lot of time in the caucus room. What like we were either like, team ignorance or team strategy we were like do they actually not know how this works how television is made how screenplays are written or is it strategic and they're just feigning ignorance but we, we spent a lot of conversation about that and sometimes the you'd be on team ignorance and then you'd go oh no i think it's team strategy uh and but i think for the most part especially the higher ups that have just like their bottom line and 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 your CEOs and stuff like that. They don't they don't care how it's made and they don't even care that it's good. They just need to make the money for Wall Street, right? Or well, everyone, we're almost out of time. I, I just have one more question. It, 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 it's springing off of this whole talk on AI. I talked with a few uh, entertainment law sources and a few labor sources about the AI situation because. As I understand, in the talks, the studios, when it came to the issue of AI, it was sort of a, well, we'll look more into it because they, they kind of, they use the defense of, well, no one's greenlit a script yet with AI. We don't know how it's going to work. And that's why they're, they, they get so reluctant to actually include it in the contract. And one source told, told me that you know, she wondered if there was going to be more traction on the AI front with SAG-AFTRA because there already is a precedent of AI being used acting like the James Earl Jones giving his voice to an AI company to do Darth Vader so they have more of a basis off of that. So Kay, I, I want to ask you is, I remember back in 2007 when the defense of, oh, we can't really include anything on streaming or new media as they call it at the time because we don't know how it works. Like how are, how is streaming going to work without ads? And that, that was the defense that they used. And then look what happened in the next 15 years. When dealing with these studios and the studios, I, I get the sense that the studios don't want to include anything in the contract that they don't, they don't see as tangible. The, 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 the WGA is trying to cut off the darkest timeline, like trying to cut off negative trends that could really, really hurt writers. Well, the studios just want to focus at the farthest uh, into the next three years. How much does that affect you guys? Why it's like, when they keep telling you, oh, we don't know if we want to really talk about this because we don't know yeah. how things are going. And they use that as the fence to to stave off some of the more existential things you're trying to address in these labor contracts. Yeah, I mean, look, they they wouldn't t talk about it at all. And the reason is they are they don't have their analytics yet. They don't. And I and I'm paraphrasing, but Carol said um we aren't going to negotiate on something that we don't know whether what we can take advantage of it was something like that of like we uh, and 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 i get it it's like they want to take advantage of it they're they don't have their analytics yet they're not they're never going to put something in there they're not going to negotiate against themselves and and 
I think when we made our proposals about it in the NBA, it does say that a writer has to be human. Um, but um, our proposals are to saying that if an AI generated script um, is given to a writer to rewrite, that that writer is the original writer, that nothing AI generated can be uh, credited, you know, like that, that then that person has to be compensated as such. And that and that that becomes that a human being's script um, and that and that also AI generated cannot rewrite someone's work. Um, so we're very, very specific. And at the end of the day, they just don't understand enough what, what, how it can help them. And I think we actually gave them ideas. <laughs> I think they were like, oh, it can do that. And it can do this. Um, and so they're, they're not going to negotiate. And I'll say this too, like a year ago, we wouldn't have been able, this probably wouldn't even, if we were negotiating a year ago, we probably wouldn't even be talking about it, but it's been changing so much and so fast that, you know, like them saying, oh, we'll have a conversation in a year. I mean, it's all nuts. Like, no, we have to, we have to do it now. This is, and in my experience on the committee, at the beginning of, uh, of meeting with the committee, AI was not something I thought was like super important. And by the end, for me personally, and I think a lot of people on the committee, it became the most important. And, um, and I, I, I think it's it's something, it's just essential. We have to do this. And otherwise, in our our strike for existence, our fight for existence, we will, you know, there will, it'll be a showrunner, maybe a, your number two person, and a machine. <laughs> that, yeah. I mean, if, a, if, if an AI can write as well as any of the people on this panel, then, then, then we've got bigger problems. Like, we should just hang it up as a species. That's not my worry. My worry is that, uh, is that AI will get to a certain level where it can provide the crappy first draft for someone else, for someone else to rewrite, or that when executives see it in the words of a screenwriter who I don't think could be uh, could be imitated by AI, they would drink the sand because they can't tell the difference. And they wouldn't necessarily think care if it's good. It really affects screenwriters. Uh, I mean, it affects everybody, but it really affects screenwriters because television is more nuanced, uh, especially comedy. Like right now, AI can't do jokes. Um, it can't really do comedy. But and and because a television show like changes and and and, uh, you know, from season to season, screenwriters, it's just that one big script and especially like action or something, you know, of that nature. And um, it can really be taken advantage of in a bad way. Um, and I, I, I think that there's been um, with actors, too. I I. I my concern is that um they're getting sides that are AI generated um, to audition with during the strike. Um, so because it's, they just want to see the person on camera and they want to continue casting and they, you know, uh, there's always these like loopholes that they're trying to do. So it's here. Yeah, every clip I see of some Boston Dynamics robot trying to mount a flight of stairs. Um, despite the abundant evidence that maybe don't make killer robots because it always goes poorly, um, does not lend me a ton of confidence that, you know, in the hands of the studios, AI will be used responsibly. But those robots just want to dance. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like for our for us as writers, like I think because a lot of students are using the chat GPT, right? Is that uh, what it's called? Yeah. Um, and, you know, st students, a lot of film students are using it to just like, when they're writing outlines or when they're, you know, and so we, again, like we as a guild is we're not saying it's not here and that we can't use it as a tool. And that in our proposal, we're saying it's just like looking something up on Wikipedia or, you know, like using a calculator to add, you know, like you can have the tool, but we, you know, we need to say like it's plagiarism and we have to have like a code of ethics within our own guild to know that writers are going to use it, but we get to use it as we want to as a tool and not a studio getting to use it to pay us less and to get rid of us. Well, guys, there's a lot of issues that are going to be playing out over the several weeks and months. It's a long road ahead here, but 
Mark, Kay, Rachel, Zach, thank you all so much for your time for discussing so much of this. Uh, we really appreciate having you here on The Wrap. Thank you for having Thanks. us. For having us. And for those of you out there watching, uh, we'll be following the strike and covering everything facing writers, facing directors, facing actors in the talks ahead with the AMPTP. Uh, you can check it out on therap.com and you can, you can subscribe to our Rap Pro section. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'm Jeremy Booster, and thanks very much.